this out of video last week, so I have my tissues. I'm always ready. How are we for this mic? Is this good? The fact that I'm standing here today is proof of one very revealing thing about God. He spends a lot of time on Facebook. That is how Pastor Eric and I first met. Evidently, we had some mutual friends, and last summer I was scrolling through my news feed, and I saw it. That face. I can tell the slides have changed. And when I saw that face, I began to pray in a very serious and profound way for him and for Sarah and for the family. And every morning, when we said to pray, a lot of times we may have a little list or someone's asked us to pray. I could not get that face out of my mind, always. <laughs> pray for Eric. Pray for Eric. And I did. And throughout the year, we began to get to know each other on Facebook and kind of discover some mutual interests or takes on things the way we do when we comment on each other's posts and still had never met. Then in January, I posted an article about recovery with a quote. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. It is human connection. I wanted my friends in the recovery community to weigh in on this idea. I have a lot of addicts in my life, both in and out of recovery, and I didn't know at the time that Eric was one of them. So we got talking in that thread, and a few days later we began, began discussing the possibility of me coming down to speak if he got his surgery approved. We finally met at a conference in San Diego in January, and then we got to share some more time at the district convention just a few weeks back. It's pretty awesome, God. Sarah, too. Okay, here we go. It's going to be good. Why we've been brought into each other's lives at this moment, I can't say. How I'm going to grow from it, how you will, we'll see. How it is that a man from Hobbs, New Mexico, pastoring a church in Encinitas, California, could ask a writer from L.A. he's never met to come preach in his church, and how it is that she would not hesitate to say yes? This I can answer. Eric and Sarah and I have been blessed to discover, as I'm sure many of you have discovered, that we are in this together. The reading today is from the lectionary, which means that today as we read this, that believers all over the world are reading the same verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Clearly, the kingdom of God is in our midst, and his kingdom is intended to bring us hope and healing and health and fullness and joy. And together in him, we are to experience what the Bible calls koinonia. It's great. Let's say it together. Koinonia. Okay, koinonia is fellowship, but not the sort of fellowship we experience at a tailgate party or a knitting circle. And those are awesome things. Those are great community things. But this is something more. This is the supernatural fellowship of God's people, formed and sustained by the Holy Spirit. Wow. I mean, who wouldn't want that? In a world starved for true connection, who wouldn't want to be part of the ultimate in ground. In a world desperate for purpose, who wouldn't want to be part
heart of the plan for the fullness of time. Are you kidding me? I'm in. But most, as we know, are not. Even many in the church are still more of the world than they are in Christ. Why? What's the problem? What's keeping us from having this full life together? What stands in the way of us all being one in Him? There it is. This has been the problem from day one, but in many ways it's a double problem in our culture today because we not only have our sinful natures forever in rebellion against God, we now live in a culture where even people in the pews have very little understanding of the core terms and doctrines of the faith. This may not be true for you, Pastor Eric seems to be a pretty awesome teacher, but sadly it's more true than not. We are a nation of people that own a lot of Bibles, but don't really have any idea what they say. And we can't help other people understand what we barely have a hold on ourselves. So two years ago, I went and got my master's in theology at Concordia University in Irvine, amazing school. And I chose to do my thesis work on sin because I'm kind of all about, let's get to the root of the problem. And as a professional communicator, I knew that the root of the problem was that the world didn't have any understanding of sin anymore. And without them knowing that, all of our promises, all the promises of the gospel are gonna fall on deaf ears. Saved from what? Forgiven for what? Well, I have no idea what we're talking about. And the reason I know that is because a very long time, a very, very long time, even as I sat in the church every week, even as an adult I learned and I grew and I served and did all the things that made it feel like I really knew what was going on, still, if a pastor would say the word sin in his sermon, I'd go, oh, and I'd cringe, I said, please don't say sin, we have visitors. <laughs> <laughs> I am a child of my generation, born in 1961, and it was in that decade, and for every decade since, that there has been a shift in norms and terms as we, we the people, sort of decided that the word sin was really just a church synonym for another three-letter word that begins with S. Anyone? Three-letter word begins with S. We use it frequently in conversations about sin. Just shout it out. Who said that? What did you say? Sex. Very good. Make sure we get her name to Pastor Eric. <laughs> there it is. So just about the time when the pill came along, we all sort of decided that we were tired of the church telling us what we could and couldn't do, and we sort of made a handshake agreement. You do your thing, and I'll do my thing. And with that little bit of pop philosophy, we felt somehow we transcended sin. By making sin an act instead of a state, we could decide it was all relative. I'll forgive you if you forgive me, and really, what do we need to be forgiven for anyway? The heart wants what the heart wants, right? Does anyone know who said that? The heart wants what the heart wants? Woody Allen. <laughs> So bit by bit, we forgot what it meant to be <coughs> sinful by nature, that sin was not about sex, not in the garden, and not in the 21st century. The whole sin equals sex connection keeps us trapped in a very narrow view of sin as act, and leads to more finger pointing than redemption. Even the church seemed to lose its way on how to teach about original sin because that term is just so weighed down with so much baggage. But whatever we call it, the meaning stays the same. Sin is a mortal predicament. Our mortal predicament. Sin is the part of ourselves that we burn and hunger in secret 
to be saved from. So this morning I'm going to introduce you to a new way to think about sin. Homo incurvatus in sin. It means man turned in on himself. Homo incurvatus in say is not some newfangled teaching I brought down from L.A., but rather the understanding of sin put forth by Martin Luther 500 years ago. The first time I heard the term, I was in a Bible study, and we had a young vicar, and he was teaching something. He wasn't teaching about this, but you know when they're just at a seminar, they like to throw the Latin terms around a lot. So he, he mentioned this, and I felt like all here in the room just was sucked out, the curtain ripped open, and I said, what? What did you say? He said, homo incurvatus in se. It was Luther's understanding of sin. And I thought, man turned in on himself. That'll translate. Think of it. Think of our culture today with our hoodies up and our earbuds in and us self-selecting every bit of content we want, only the music we want to hear, only the news we want to hear, only the people we want to see, narrow, 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 so we can only have everything our own way. I said, this is a way for us to understand sin. So why do we turn in on ourselves? We turn in on ourselves because we want to be our own God. We want to be in charge. We want to be the boss of our lives. And we don't want to deal with the fact that we hurt ourselves and the people around us in the process. This idea that our sin hurts other people is something that has been understood by every culture in human history. Until now. Every culture in recorded history recognized that life was a gift from God or the gods and that sin was the central flaw in the human condition, and that it put both individuals and communities at risk. So it is no small thing that we have lost this understanding, and that we need to find a way to reclaim it. This image will help as we consider what a body looks like when it's curved in on itself. The shape of the curve does two things. It protects and defends the thing it is turned in on, guarding it and the right to have it to oneself, preferably in the secret shadow of the curve. And two, its curved form creates a barrier between the heart's desire and the things it wants to keep at bay. Judgment, change, help, love, God. This is not just some obscure academic theory or outdated theological jargon, but rather something each and every one of us experiences the consequences of in some form every day as a new epidemic invades our daily lives. Anxiety. If you personally don't suffer from anxiety, it is a statistical certainty that someone in your immediate circle does. Anxiety disorders have increased 1,200% in the past 30 years. Anxiety reigns in a world where the felt truth of everyone's in charge is that no one's in charge. Anxiety is the ever-mutating, self-created chaos bouncing back on modern man. Anxiety is vigilance that has lost sight of God. We first hear about vigilance in the garden when Adam is told to work it and take care of it. In the Hebrew, take care of means to guard, protect, keep safe, watch over, keep vigil. Vigilance is the God-given emotion to respond to a threat and the constructive concern for the well-being of others. Vigilance is a good thing. It's a God-given gift. We are to watch out for threats and to look for opportunities to nurture and to develop. And we are able to watch out for others because we know that God is watching out for us. So what happens when we take God out of the equation? 
Now we're just a bunch of people endlessly scanning the horizon for threats or opportunities. Like this, danger, danger. Oh, what can I do? Can I turn something? Can I get some traction over here? Maybe I can make something happen over here. Get a little something going. Oh, oh, here it comes. Here comes an attack. There's even a term that we use all the time now in business. Some of you in the business world may know this acronym. It's called a SWOT analysis. Does anybody know what SWOT stands for in a SWOT analysis? Can you tell me? There you go. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we decided we wanted to be in charge, right? But if everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. And we feel that in our bones. And we are all turned in on ourselves, trying to be our own God. And what does that make our neighbor? Our neighbor becomes our competition in a zero-sum existence that we created. The neighbor that we were intended to love and care for is now our competition. Martin Luther, who struggled mightily with anxiety, believed that one cannot deal with life's daily fears without first making peace with life's ultimate fear, death. If Luther is right, then America is not getting any closer to the target. In the fall of 2012, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America issued a report touting the many new drugs being developed for mental illness. 26 of them were for anxiety. That's in one year, in addition to the ones we already had and all the ones that have been developed in the last three years since then. And just this week, Forbes magazine announced that the people responsible for the creation of OxyContin, the strongest, most addictive painkiller on the market and in wide use, illegally and informally. That family has just joined the list of richest billionaire families in the U.S. And so the question presses in, why? Why are we in so much pain? Our disordered desires for admiration, power, wealth, and success have not just trickled down, but shot out over our children like a fire hose. If progress is measured in the mental health and happiness of young people, then we have been going backward at least since the early 1950s. That doesn't come from the church, that comes from psychology today. And we say, well, gosh, these are anxious times. Of course, people are anxious. I and mean, look at the world, look at the world. Wrong. The rates of anxiety and depression in young people were far lower during the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and the tumultuous periods of social change of the 1960s and early 70s than they are today. The clearest evidence seems to suggest that children and college-age students are more anxious than ever because they have lost the essential belief that they are in control of their own destinies. A destiny that can only be found in their one-of-a-kind and wholly inspired God-given vocations. But we don't approach it that way anymore. We are no longer teaching kids to build themselves from the inside out, but rather from the outside in. We are raising kids to look good on paper, to compete. And in this, there is almost no statistical distinction between Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or wholly non-religious parents. We have all bought into the same lie. Just this week, we see further proof as a new book called Excellent Sheep draws some very clear connections between what we call helicopter parents and the dramatic rise in anxiety and depression in college students. The author writes, for students haunted their whole lives by a fear of failure, often in the first instance by their parents' fear of failure, the cost of falling short, even temporarily, becomes not merely practical, but existential. We're in this together. This is not a reality any of us can
ridiculous came from. Whether or not we contributed directly to the problem, and I'll just save us all some time wondering, we did. You did. I did. We all did. And now we are not all now in this sea of anxiety and competitiveness and fear together. And guess who's in it with us? Jesus. Jesus, who Hebrews tells us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, who knows full well that there is nothing new under the sun. Jesus, who is the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Because Jesus takes our turned in states and forgives them. He forgives us in spite of our default setting to want to go it alone. He loves us anyway, calling gently to us to return to Him with all our hearts. Just say the word, Jesus. And He will free, free of all of us to turn out towards Him and out towards one another. Lead us gently, patiently, week by week, and moment by moment, and with each inevitable stumble, and there will be stumbles, He will guide us away from the path of sin, the path that leads to death. This is another connection that is so hard for modern ears to make. Sin and death and the blood of Jesus, what is that all about? I mean, what does sin have to do with death? I just sinned this morning, and I'm still alive. What does Jesus on a cross have to do with me? The whole blood thing. Well, that's just a little too primitive for our eye-tuned ears to comprehend, right? We hear about blood in our verse today. In him we have redemption through his blood. Our modern world is pretty sterile, filled with digits and optics, and for most of us, far removed from the blood and mess and stench of death. But these words, this image, would not have been hard for the listeners in Paul's day to understand. Whether pagan or Jew, all cultures of Jesus' day believed that where there was sin, a price needed to be paid. The Greek philosophers, they reached the same conclusion. And for the Jewish people, the sin-blood connection was second nature. They had the law and the ritual understanding of the sin offering, of the sacrifice of goats and sheep, and the blood of one without blemish. The blood of Jesus was the day you want of all those earlier sacrifices. So yeah, there was a time when sin and the need for redemption was universally understood, but not now. So how do we navigate our lives in a world that no longer recognizes this as a universal truth? Well, it may help to remember Paul's words to the Hebrews, in which he echoes the prophet Jeremiah speaking about the new covenant. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We may be living in a time where a life of faith is no longer the norm, where the culture seems to speak a very different language, but that has not changed the promises of God or the fact that His law has been placed in our minds and in our hearts. The fact that a scapegoat is needed seems to be written on our hearts. Who can tell me what this movie this is from? Oh, good. The Hunger Games, one of the best-selling trilogies and highest-grossing movie franchises of all times, is a story that begins with this curiously biblical notion that someone must pay the price so that the rest may live. I remember when I saw the movie first thinking simply, love conquers death. That's the whole story. We're nearing the end of it. You probably remember Katniss saves Peta, and we'd all thought we'd reached our happy ending. But then, as it so often happens, the rules changed. The finish line was moved. They would not both be allowed to live. Only one could. And so in a moment of pure love and sacrifice and an unwillingness to bend to the cruel and arbitrary rules of this world, they made their own covenant. 
they would die together. But unlike the tragic ending in Romeo and Juliet, here their witness changed the world, their world. Seeing that the fear of death had no hold on them, the powers that be changed their mind. Both would be allowed to live. Love had conquered death. So when we feel overwhelmed or afraid that people outside church walls will never be able to understand the message of the gospel, fear not. Jesus is at work in the world, weaving his way into the narrative, creating files in people's spirits for his word to enter in. He's listening to their pain and inviting us to do the same. Knowing that these worldly narratives about fear and brokenness and death that leads to life are a preparation or an echo. Not the word of God, but a cry in the wilderness. How many of you watch this show? Yeah, you're the demographic. There we go. If you do, <laughs> if you do, you're in good company. It's the number one show in all of tele television in the 18 to 49 year old age group. The Walking Dead is a story about a post-apocalyptic world inhabited by zombies, the undead, those who seek the blood of humans to restore them to life. The series hero is a small town sheriff who tries to protect his family and bring something like order to the hellish world he woke from a coma to find himself in, a world in which certain humans are even more dangerous than the zombies themselves. What need in us is this show meeting? And where do these images of the walking dead come from? And what scriptural teachings could we connect them to? Sometimes I wonder if maybe the church has become so preoccupied with the disappointment of being part of a post-Christian culture that we're failing to recognize the heart and spirit of messages like these plastered all around us. Messages literally crying out in blood for forgiveness. Are we listening? Are we stepping outside our sanctuary walls to connect with people who may be expressing their need for God in unconventional ways? Can we begin to attune our ears to them so that in time they may begin to attune their ears to the Word of God? I think we can. I think the Psalms are always a good place to start. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Oh, the 
places you'll go. Being so close to Lil Hoya, I had to throw in a little talk. <laughs> this past year, as you journeyed as a church through the shadow of the Valley of Death with Pastor Eric and Sarah and the whole Tricky family, you've had a chance to see firsthand what it looks like when light shines in the darkness. To stand shoulder to shoulder with a family as Jesus asks us all to believe that he has conquered death once for all. To have a hint of what it means to be forced to grow in spiritual maturity until all you can see is light. And today we are reminded once again that he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. And we are all invited to be a part of that plan. And in Him, we truly are in this place.